Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to New Books in History, a channel in the New Books Network. I'm your host, Michael Van of Sacramento State University. Today I'm chatting with Noah Schusterman about Armed Citizens, The Road from Ancient Rome to the Second Amendment, which was published by the University of Virginia Press in 2020. Dr. Schusterman is an Associate Professor of History at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. His previous books include Religion and the Politics of Time, Holidays from Louis XIV to Napoleon, out with the Catholic University of America Press in 2010, and The French Revolution, Faith, Desire, and Politics, with Rutledge Press in 2014. This work was translated into Dutch in 2015 and had a second edition in 2020. An historian of early modern Europe and the Atlantic world, Dr. Schusterman's research focuses on the late 18th century and the revolutions of France and the United States. He earned his PhD in 2004 at the University of California, Berkeley, with a dissertation on religion and state building in old regime and revolutionary France. He previously taught at Temple University before arriving in Hong Kong in 2014. Noah Schusterman, Noah, if I may, welcome to New Books in History. Thanks, Michael. I'm glad to be here. I'm a big fan of this channel. Yeah. So you're um, you're in Hong Kong. Um, how are things in Hong Kong? Uh, it's 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 a tricky question. I mean, for me and my family, they're good. Uh, we're insulated from a lot of the things that have been going on uh, over the last few years. Um, and we're healthy, um, but it's it's been it's been heartbreaking seeing what's happening here. Uh, there's no question about that. Um, and seeing what uh, what a lot of the students at at the university are having to go through, uh, it's a it's a very different different place in the world than than I expected. Yeah, and it's been the the double whammy of political changes plus the the pandemic. Um, so. <laughs> Anyway, um, and before we get into armed citizens, the road to the road from ancient Rome to the Second Amendment, would you please tell us a bit about your intellectual formation? Um, how did you start with holidays, religion, and state building, and then transition into militias and the transatlantic origins of the Second Amendment? Uh, well, I, I, I'm old, uh, middle aged, <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, I got to graduate school you're, in the mid nineties. You're younger than me. You're younger than me. So I know two that. years. <laughs> two years. <laughs> We're middle aged, Mike. Um, but I, I got to graduate school in the mid nineties, and uh, I was very much interested in uh, becoming an early modernist. And uh, but the the way that things kind of pushed me, um, I, I wound up focusing a lot more just on France than I had intended to. And uh, sort of got sucked in by the questions of the the old regime and the revolution itself, because uh, there really was just so much to study there, um, and convinced that uh, the people had been under appreciating the the religious motivations that people had uh, during that time. It was sort of a striking thing when you got to look at what got published during the time and um, people's willingness to to ignore that most of the debates that were happening were debates about religion. Um, and then uh, I got to Berkeley and my advisor, Peter Sollins, uh, rightly really pushed me to, to take a, a view that – they went a little bit past uh, some of the sort of excesses of cultural history and the excesses of linguistic turn history that were uh, that were going on at the time. And uh, without without naming names, I think I know who you're talking about. And <laughs> we were in graduate school at the same time. I remember uh, plowing through some of those works. Uh, some some people more uh, egregious than others, but there was this was a time. I mean, for people going to graduate school now, I mean, people in the nineties, it seemed very exciting to talk about the conditions that made something imaginable, and now it's just a little bit more cliche. So, so uh, he 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 pushed me rightly to to um to write a, a dissertation that really was about state building, that really did have real issues of power involved, uh, even as I, I took a, a cultural history approach that that looked at for, uh, not consensus, but looked for wide-scale agreement rather than necessarily focusing on every conflict. Um, and that was, the, it, it just, it was a topic that, it, that it seems very alien to me now, but it really just obsessed me for, for you know the time I was writing it, um, and uh, 
from there, I started writing, a, you know, I finished that um, for the better part of a decade. I was working at, like I said, at Temple University, but off the tenure track with limited research opportunities. And um, I was, I started writing a second book that, um, or let me say what I wanted to say about the revolution and about the roles of gender and religion in the revolution. And um, I was finishing that up when Sandy Hook happened. And when Sandy Hook happened, uh, on the one hand, I was already, you know, at some level looking for a next project, but but feeling that I, I had an urge to, among other things, this period of the of the '90s when I was starting my research, um, was a period when I think a lot of the, knowingly or, or unknowingly, a lot of the research going on was separated from political concerns, um, including people who were talking about, you know, the free play of the signifier and thought they were doing something far more, I'm going to make some enemies here, I don't need to, but th- thought they were doing something far more transgressive than they actually were. Um, and so that's what I, you know, I, I, I Sandy Hook happened and uh, I, you know, the way people talk about it, I mean, the thing that seemed very obvious to me is that uh, at some level, this is an 18th century problem. Um, the the Constitution is an 18th century document. The Second Amendment, especially, is is an 18th century um, is a product of the 18th centuries, and as it turns out, earlier centuries. And that um, I just started researching what I could in in at the very beginning, setting a pretty broad net about what could and could not be relevant to 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 understanding it mm-hmm. and and this contemporary crisis has origins in your uh er- era of expertise uh, i think so i certainly yeah. think that yeah. you know from something close enough to my area of expertise that i had something or to er- contribute er- er- era uh as era, yeah. I mean, the, you know the um late 18th century yeah, even not having been an Americanist, there's things that you spot in these debates and recognize as having come out from uh, an 18th century, um, an 18th century background. Um, the French Revolution it doesn't lead directly to the Second Amendment. It you know it, it's still going on when the Second Amendment comes out. But this idea of it, one thing you hear a lot by well, by 1793, especially, I'm getting a little into the weeds here, is this idea that every soldier is a citizen and every citizen is a soldier. And that, I mean, in some ways, at some background level, this was the the way I got into thinking about the Second Amendment, this coming out of this same general collection of ideas that they would see this, this identification of the two. Yeah, yeah. In a, in a minute or two, I want to circle back around to that. I mean, I think the the transatlantic um, focus of this book is is really important. But um, let me ask you. You know, Armed Citizens works in um, several different genres of history: intellectual history, political history. Also, very much engages the history of race, racism, and white supremacy. And how how do you characterize the book? Um, you know, what what kind of a what kind of history is this? It is a, it, it's a mixed, it's a mixed methodology, I think is safe to say, um, uh, because there's a few chapters, the the Machiavelli chapter, the section on Andrew Fletcher that I, I think are at some level, these are intellectual history. You know, nobody's going to re- mistake me for Quentin Skinner, but that's, I'm trying to rehearse their arguments and, and make them understandable to, to readers who don't have a background in in that, uh, but certainly, I wanted to to talk about how people, knowingly or unknowingly, implemented those ideas. Um, there wasn't, as I was starting out, there wasn't much that I wanted to stay away from in terms of methods, except that I knew that I wasn't going to be doing a full on archival research work. Uh, one of the things that was really surprising uh, as I started to really, for the first time since high school, systematically read in U.S. history, and that was the first time since college, systematically reads in U.S. history. Um, yep, sorry to, to um, uh, 
my excellent U.S. history college professors. Um, <laughs> hi, Steve. Hi, Larry. Um, uh, hi, Jane. There is a um, in reading on this topic. There is an overlap between history legal history and just law studies and um, law journals that that coming from a European background, uh, I, I, you almost never come across. I think I've read one or two things in a French journal, a French law journal. Um, every once in a while, you'll read a book on a particular French revolution subject. It turns out to be written by a lawyer, but it, it's, it's not a main thing. Um, and uh, there, there's some really good articles in law journals um, about um, about issues related to the Second Amendment. But um, overall, I found that that legal approach was, uh, I, first off, way too dominant in the lives that people in the United States have to lead, uh, but also in the study of it. Um, so it's not a legal history of the Second Amendment, uh, of which there are already many, uh, for one thing. Um, but I, I went back to some of the things I, uh, I did learn and still value as the 90s graduate student, which is um, the importance of asking the right questions and especially uh, the importance of understanding and being willing to ask the questions that the people you're writing about themselves were asking. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, a lot of debate about the Second Amendment, maybe a little bit less so now, but a lot of the debate for a few decades was about this question of an individual right. And it's a, you know, it's a, it's a valid legal question. Legal theorists can ask what questions they want to. It's not good history. It's not good history to start with that as your question because it's not a question that people were asking at the time. Yeah, exactly. Oh. And I, I, that really came across in the book. And I found that so persuasive. Sort of, and it, and it avoids. I mean, we'll talk about this later on. But this, you know, the the trap of presentism. I mean, it's it's getting into their framing of the Second Amendment and and the and the Constitution. They're thinking about militias, which we'll we'll talk about. But um, so. I mean, this leads to the next question I wanted to ask you. Um, armed Citizens begins and ends with the statement that the Second Amendment no longer makes sense. Um, when you conclude the book, you qualify this a little bit by saying it no longer makes sense for the society that America has become. So could you could you explain that for us? Uh, sure. Uh, part of it is... Uh, <laughs> Part of it is the obvious that we're, you know, what are we, 30,000, 40,000 gun deaths a year? Uh, that's, it's obscene. It's, it's, uh, and there's no reason to pretend that this is okay or acceptable or makes sense. Um, that's not the main thrust of the book, however. Um, uh, the book is not some sort of clarion call for for gun control, even though I, I support gun control. Uh, I, there is, as an historian, another question, which is, uh, Michael, if I ask you, um, why is a well-regulated militia necessary for the security of a free state? Do you know how to answer that? I, do, I don't think I want a militia around my neighborhood, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess I should say I, I would hope that you know, since you read the book, you'd have some sense. Yeah. But, but I, mean, I don't think people know. Uh, I don't think yeah. people can answer that question. Yeah, um, yeah. And the, it, the amendment is not very long. Um, some amendments yeah. are. You know, the Fourteenth Amendment. You can find a phrase within it that people are going to have trouble explaining because it's very long. But um, people will, you know, quote this at you and call themselves Second Amendment absolutists. But, but, this, you know. This, to me, is the key to the amendment. Uh, this idea that a well-regulated militia is necessary for the security of a free state. It is something that everybody involved in the writing of the amendment, whether they supported it or not, whether they supported this particular phrasing or not, uh, understood that phrase. And, uh, and I don't think people understand it now. Uh, and... Um, and, and that's why um, 
Uh, I think, I, and that's more the where I wanted to to place this book in this this idea that people don't understand that anymore. People did then, um, and so in that phrase doesn't make sense to you if you can't uh, say why a well-regulated militia would be necessary for the security of a free state uh, then the amendment doesn't make sense to you yeah and, and the also, second I mean, half might just I mean for you know contemporary American citizens I mean what what is a militia you know we have we have a standing army I mean it's there's been this dramatic trans transformation obviously of the United States as military military capabilities I mean what would what would a militia do in my neighborhood here in Santa Cruz? I mean, defend us against. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it, it, it's it's just unimaginable. It's such, it's such a. I mean, just the dramatic transformation. That how how could this even have resonance today? So, like when you when you ask that question, rhetorical as it was, I mean, it, it still catches me flat footed. It's like, no, this has like no bearing on contemporary American society, right? Right. Well, it's not what would the militia would be. I mean, that's not the question that you would be asking. You would be asking, what would I be doing as a member of the militia? Oh, yeah. <laughs> as, as a citizen, right? Like, well, I don't as a citizen, want, I, don't, yeah. I don't want to be, see, there's the problem. I don't want to be in a militia. I don't think I'd be a very good soldier, um, <laughs> weekend or otherwise. I don't, I, I stayed out of the Navy because I heard you had to get up early and make your bed every morning. And that, uh, that scared me. Um, much to the chagrin of my grandfather, but, um, um, so the, um, the structure of the book is a chronological journey, um, to the second amendment. And while this might seem very clear and straightforward, um, it's actually sort of an unexpected, uh, path. I mean, you start in Italy over 2000 years ago and then take us to France and England. And it's not even to the fifth chapter that we really get into, what will become the United States of America. So you, you touched on this already, but why was this transnational approach um, important to you for this um, this very American topic? I mean, what's what's more American than the, the Second Amendment as a topic? But why what, what why this transnational approach? Uh, a couple things. Um, one of them, um, when I look back at what was important to people writing the Constitution uh, and people writing about the Constitution, debating the Constitution, I kept coming back to their own investigations of historical precedents. Uh, so I wanted to trace those. Uh, I talk about that with um, George Washington's sentiments on I, – I always get this title wrong, but it's basically sentiments on a peace establishment – and he talks about, you know, I don't need to explain why a militia is necessary, but if you want to know, go look at Greece, go look at Rome. And he could point to a set of uh, historical precedents or in, interpret shared interpretations of historical precedents and count on uh, educated readers being familiar with that. And, and that knowledge was lost. Um, second... Uh, I was very conscious of writing a book that would enter into a larger literature. Uh, I'm not the first person to write on the Second Amendment. I'm not going to be the last person. I wanted to to be able to add things that were missing from uh, from this literature. Uh, Saul Cornell um, is a historian, an Americanist who's been writing on the Second Amendment for years. Uh, if I try to redo what he's doing, I, I won't do it as well, and people don't need it. Um, more people should read Lawrence Cress's work. Um, but even if they don't, I, I don't want to write what he's already written. Um, and I, I wrote this book slowly. So now there's, there's a lot more authors. Um, Carol Anderson coming out, um, has come out with a book recently that, uh, I, I didn't know about, but, but I, I knew that at some level, this was a, a it's, it's not actually a crowded field historically, but it's a field where you want to pick a, a new spot to to do, uh, and the other thing, and this is maybe an answer for for grad students that that listen to these podcasts. Uh, in terms of academic publishing, um, there's always a question of like, what do I have to say? Uh, who am I to say it, and who can I say it to? And I knew that there was there were stories there, especially um, the Julius Caesar account, that that really need to be put into this discussion of the Second Amendment. And I also knew that, you know, 
me, this guy trained in European history, sort of, you know, an interloper among the Americanists, uh, I have no business writing about ancient Rome. Uh, you know, I, who am I going to send that? You know, if I have just have a journal article about ancient Rome, I don't read Latin. Who am I going to send this to? Um, but but a book gives you an opportunity to uh, uh, when you're writing a book like this. Um, when sort of the hook is is on an overall interpretation, uh, you can get a chapter in on Julius Caesar. You can get a chapter in on on Richelieu and uh, and share what you have to say, uh, and and from there hope that it it makes it into the larger uh, into the larger debates. Yeah, and it, and I thought that your um, your analysis also deprovincialized um, the so called founding fathers that um, that they are they are part of a transatlantic intellectual ferment and are paying attention to ideas in England, but and also in France and and further back, um, which you know leads me to the next thing I wanted to ask you about, um, and that was your discussion of um, the, the so called founding fathers' use of. Ro- or you says of Roman history, um, you know George Washington was famously compared to Cincinnatus, the uh, the Roman who served as dictator but then uh, gave up power to return to farming, and he you know he's the good example from Roman history. And Julius Caesar, on the other hand, uh, plays a very different uh, role in the Roman Republic and um, uh, and for the Second Amendment, or rather the authors of the second amendment. So could you, could you say a bit, mo- bit more about the significance of the Roman examples for the, um, the writers of the constitution and of the, the bill of rights? Sure. So one thing I found, uh, George Washington is, or for me anyway, um, was a good person to write. Uh, he is, they, they, you would, Say of him, if he was somebody alive today, I, I don't mean this to offend people who who hold him on a higher pedestal, but the term for him today would be brand conscious. Um, he he had uh, he had an eye on his legacy. He had a very clear idea about what his legacy would be, uh, and he understood that his legacy would be greater as a Cincinnatus uh, than as a Caesar. Which is to say that if he and it, the the um, I think the the play Hamilton actually gets this right. You know that he's you know his he understands the importance of the of his willingness to walk away. Um, but um, he uh, this is very conscious on his part. Um, when he returned to retired to his estate, he was making himself he was modeling himself after Cincinnatus, uh, the the Roman. Uh, dictator. Dictator was an official Roman title given temporarily uh, to uh, a single leader during the Republic uh, in times of crisis. Um, but Julius Caesar is a story I really wanted to tell um, because uh, I've mentioned Andrew Fletcher already. I, I think that between the story of Julius Caesar, or at least the interpretation of Julius Caesar, and the writings of Andrew Fletcher, I think you can get 90%, 95% of the way towards understanding uh, the explicit reasoning that the founders had for declaring that uh, a well-regulated militia was necessary for the security of a free state. Uh, Caesar represented the problem of how to maintain civil control over military power. Uh, that's a question that, that any non-military government has to address. Um, uh, and, uh, and Caesar, you know, so C- Julius Caesar used his army to take over Rome. Um, and it, you can say this about any other, you know, did Char- Charlemagne used his control over an army to take over, you know, huge swaths of, uh, what we now call Europe. But there were more lessons um, that Julius Caesar had than that. He's the the story is that for centuries Rome had had a citizens' army, and in the century before Julius Caesar, um, uh, what's called the Marian reforms had allowed poorer Roman citizens to become what amounted to professional soldiers, um, career soldiers, and. Um, Yes, 
generals will tend to want to seize power, um, but in the 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 Republican interpretation was that uh, previous generations of Roman leaders had commanded armies of uh, Roman citizens who were uh, militiamen. They were part time soldiers. Uh, citizen soldiers, I guess we'll use the term. They were part-time soldiers who had their own livelihoods. They had their own careers to go back to, usually a farm to go back to. And once the the military crisis was over, uh, they would do that. They would go back to their farms. Uh, and as a result, they were Rome's soldiers. Their loyalty was to Rome. Uh, Caesar uh, was put in command of an army of uh, full-time soldiers who didn't have other careers to go back to. And so this interpretation goes, their loyalty was not to Rome, but to Caesar. Um, now, meanwhile, the Roman law was that uh, a general could not, under most situations, lead his army into Rome itself, with the border being the Rubicon River. And Rome, uh, well, Julius Caesar orders his soldiers for a variety of background reasons, um, but they don't matter here, uh, to to cross the Rubicon, to march on Rome itself, uh, essentially declaring war on uh, on his fellow Roman leaders, but you could say declaring war on the Roman Republic itself. And this shows the danger of, this shows the danger of professional soldiers. The interpretation is that uh, previous generations of soldiers loyal to Rome would have disobeyed that order. But the professional soldiers, because they're loyal to Julius Caesar and not to Rome, they will follow him and they will uh, basically bring an end to the Republic itself. Now, you add to this, what I still think is the one thing really worth thinking through from this, uh, from this whole collection of ideas, discussions that leads up to the Second Amendment. Um, the other thing that, that the Second Amendment pro-militia writers, let's say just the, the, the standing army critics, the pro-militia writers take from this is that uh, for a law to effectively govern the military those laws must contain within themselves a mechanism of their own enforcement. Um, it's kind of a, a complicated, I don't know if it's a complicated idea to understand. It's a complicated idea for me to articulate. Uh, but Julius Caesar broke the law when he ordered his army across the Rubicon. He becomes a criminal uh, when he does that. But guess what? He's got an army. Like you can't just be like, oh, no, 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 you broke the law. You have to stop and you have to walk yourself to the jail. No, you have to have a way to actually prevent this from happening. Um, and uh, this is something that that is a central preoccupation of um, of all the thought that goes into the Second Amendment and a lot of the um, the the discussions that go on afterwards. Um uh, you you really I mean in uh, I'll just say that you if you look for this in the post uh, January 2020 discussions of what happened then you see you don't see the same debates but you see echoes of the different answers that that people uh, in the subsequent generations came up with because it, it wasn't the Second Amendment that it was an oddly un-Second Amendment solving. Anyway, I, I babbled on a little bit there, but I think I got the main ideas across. So you, if you understand the implications uh, that that the founding era took from Julius Caesar crossing the Rubicon, you, you're very you, you've come a long way towards understanding why a, a well regulated why a well regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free state. Right, it's it's the argument: the soldier is citizen, and citizen is soldier. Right, that they've got an investment to the abstract as opposed to Caesar or Westmoreland or or Trump. Right? Yeah. If we tend to today to to have very different ideas about what is a, a national soldier and what is uh you know a, a U, a, an american citizen in the us army a um a, a chinese citizen in the 
the the Chinese army, um, uh, a you know pick a nation, pick an army, um, but and, and to really differentiate that from you know some sort of soldier of fortune mercenary who would go and hire uh, hire themselves out to other places to other nations. Um, is that distinction existed uh, at the time, but um, but the stronger distinction was between whether you were a part-time soldier uh, fighting, you know, when your nation needed you, or if you were a paid professional soldier. And there's a lot of accusations of um, of being a mercenary aimed at professional soldiers of. Um, uh, even if you're fighting for your own country, uh, I've overstated this um, uh, because this was an active debate. But this idea that you know, uh, well, uh, that uh, I shouldn't overstate it. But this distinction was not; these distinctions were cut differently uh, during the early modern era and, and, and through the 18th century. Well, let me let me ask you. Then the subsequent chapters engage um, Niccolo Machiavelli, Cardinal Richelieu, Louis the Thirteenth. Um, how do these Italians and and French impact this very American thing of the Second Amendment? Machiavelli really. So the things about Machiavelli, um, he really brings a lot of these ideas into into focus. Um, and I wanted to include that. Um, I wanted to include his ideas about citizen soldiers. You know, he's saying, uh, you can't pay a mercenary enough to die for you. You can only pay them enough to make yourselves poor. And, um, he thinks that, you know, he wants, well, he he's an early author in really pushing that we should go back to Rome and specifically the Roman Republic. We should take the lessons from that. Um, it, it's not a given if you were, you know, a person trying to decide what was the best era of Rome. It's not a given that you'll choose the, the Republic over the empire. The empire had much better art. The empire had much larger um, uh, land holdings and the empire, you didn't necessarily have to be a soldier if you didn't want to be. The Republic and, and was a much better circuses, better circuses, <laughs> better, better, better um, chariot racing, right? <laughs> better, better drama, better, you know, <laughs> uh, for a lot of modern concerns, um, this was, this was what you'd want, but he is the first one that I, that I know of to really articulate, um, the virtues of of this Roman Republic, and to especially there's there's a lot of debates among Machiavelli scholars about the relationship between his different works, uh, but he's consistent on this. He hated mercenaries. He wanted to have uh, Italy, hopefully Venice, or, um, sorry Florence at least. Um, Re, um, rediscover the, the virtues of militia life. Um, now, I did try to put in enough sort of signals in the book that um, to, to academics reading it that you can go ahead and skip this chapter on Machiavelli, that I'm not saying that much new there. Um, I think Pocock's book came out in 75, um, and it, it led to a lot of very interesting debates about Machiavelli, uh, which I'm, you know, I, I'm just a guy. I, I'm just a guy trying to, you know, to make sense of that. You know, I, I can kind of sort of read Italian, but I'm not, I, but I didn't for this chapter. Um, I wanted non-academic, if you say Machiavellian in normal context, um, outside of academics, people still it's think derog- of it as- It's derogatory. It's derogatory, yeah. right? It depends on your own morality, but you still think of it as somebody as a backstabbing, conniving, um, uh, you know, it's a James Carville, um, what's it? Well, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, somebody who will dirty trick you um, and not somebody who values the you know, the moral rectitude you get from serving in the military. Uh, and so I wanted, again, I wanted to have an explanation there that um, 
that non-academics would, you know, would understand. Um, and as for France, it's, um, uh, France is the boogeyman in this story, um, all up until 1777. Yeah, and, um, and that's what I really appreciated uh, about, about that these sections there. But so so go on. <laughs> yeah, how, there how was an earlier of the boogeyman. <laughs> there was an earlier version of this book where um, there was going to be much more France included, uh, and 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 where I would acknowledge the existence of, of the half of the population. That's well, there there was going to be a, a another version of this book that was much more centered, much more inclusive of French developments and also much more inclusive of gender issues. And I, I still have things to say about that, but the, my research went uh, in a different direction, not without regrets. Um, but uh, basically Linda Colley, and this is a while ago, this is maybe 1990. She, she wrote a book called the Britons really emphasizing the way that English people define themselves against the French and, um, uh, at a time when national and, and I, I, Britain is is a little bit tricky in terms of national, um, that national identities were being were being formed, and what you saw in France during this, you know, starting in in uh, the early 17th century, uh, really ballooning during Louis the Fourteenth era, is that they built up an enormous administrative state and an enormous standing army. And, um, you know, just tens of thousands, over a hundred thousand full-time soldiers and, uh, just scare the English. Um, and, and rightly so. I mean, yes, it's England is an island and we can look back and think, okay, nothing actually happened. Um, but, but there was every reason for England to be scared of the developments going on there, um, that threatened them. And... There were, I mean, I talk about this, um, there were English kings that tried to mimic France there and tried to grow their own professional armies, but, uh, but they couldn't, um, you know, there's a, this, this moment I, 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 you know, I brought up in the siege of La Rochelle where the English are trying to scale the walls of the, of a French fort and, and literally their ladders aren't high enough, um, and, you know, it, it, they just, they weren't measuring up. And, and so there is this whole movement where they, they make, um, they make a virtue of necessity. Um, it's not that their standing army isn't big enough. It's that they don't want one. Um, and why don't they want one? Well, because England is free and England is free because they do not have a standing army. Uh, and France is enslaved and they are enslaved because of their army, Be, you know, and well, this is a, um, th this is, this is a weird step that you, that, you know, if you take it linear, linearly, you're not going to get a lot of French origins to the second amendment. Uh, but if you look at England as having been a European nation in the rivalries between European nations, uh, you see the huge influence that, that France and, and other European nations, but especially France, had on uh, their political development, but also what I highlight there is their intellectual development. Yeah, and and the, the negative example of of France's standing army and that, that terrifying, the uh, – uh, the English and then and and the the English in the Americas who will go on to be the founders of the United States, correct? Oh, sure. Um, it, well, the English in England were were rightly terrified that French armies were going to to land in I don't know Dover. Well, not so much the, the 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 fear of the actual French army, or but becoming like them, like this again, following from Susan Colley's. Um, uh, 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 book on on the English defining themselves against the French. I mean, this is, extends across the Atlantic, and that that transatlantic sense of um, you know what the ideal political system is is it's it's not this massive uh, behemoth that is the the French state and the French army and so forth. There's a degree of freedom, and the militia will is a symbol of that as opposed to the permanent standing army. 
correct? Oh, very much so. Yeah. Very yeah, much so. Yeah. What, what's yeah, the so point that, of of building an army to defend yourself against the French if in the process of building that army, you become French? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no um, absolutely. And, um, you know, as a world historian, I really appreciated that because, you know, the world historian is always so bad about not including what what becomes the United States and the United States in their world history narratives at the whole time they cluck their tongues at Americanness for not putting America in the world. But for, so for me as a world historian, this was a great example here. It's like, oh, like, here's this transatlantic thinking. Here's the um, the way, you know, this, this tension between England and France and England's self-definition as not French gets transported to uh to the east coast of what becomes the united states and is is so central to this document that's with us to this day but anyway um so m- moving on you you getting into um colonial america you contrast two rebellions um uh, bacon's rebellion and the stono rebellion and and without getting into too much detail here because they're both really important stories. Um, could you introduce these two events and explain how they shaped American colonial thinking uh, about militias? And I was particularly struck by the two different histories of race that these case studies offer. One is an example of settler colonial violence against the indigenous people. And the other is um, uh, a case of race-based violence of white slave owners against enslaved uh, Africans. Our African uh, descendants of, of Africa, um, of course, of course, both are examples of America's history of white supremacy. But what role do they play in in different but similar ways in this path towards the uh, the Second Amendment? Yeah, thanks. They're, they are very different events, um, but I felt like I needed both uh, to well. I needed something like Bacon's Rebellion and something like the Stoner Rebellion. Uh, Bacon's Rebellion was 1676, and it was a it was a, a dispute. I don't know. That's not. That's a little too. It started as a disagreement uh, between, uh, on the one hand, between. Uh, Virginia settlers and uh, neighboring indigenous people. And on the other hand, a dispute between uh, relatively recent settlers in Virginia and the colonial authorities, um, Nathaniel Bacon versus uh, Sir William Berkeley. And uh, this was, I mean, it shows on the one hand that the militia was, you know, when it came down to it, uh, the militia was a, uh, a military institution that that allowed for white expropriation of Native American lands. Um, the the ideas about militia evolved in the old world. The militia as an institution there was dying at the time. Uh, Sixteen seventy six, not yet, um, but over the course of the eighteenth century, it was. But the the colonies and, and I focus on uh, what was going on on the North American mainland, but there's there's various things to be said about the the islands. I'm not going to talk about the Pacific. I know nothing about it, but the the different islands in the Atlantic. Um, militias thrived in the New World because England, um, especially, they weren't going to send professional soldiers over. They didn't have that many professional soldiers at the start of this, and they weren't going to spend the money on it. And the col- the colonists were there to, uh, to defend, you know, to defend themselves. And, uh, you know, maybe this could mean defending themselves against irrationally hostile Native American tribes, but usually it was going to mean, uh, taking away land from Native Americans who had already cultivated that land and, and hoped to keep it. Um, and the colonists did this in the, generally speaking, through the, through the militia, uh, that, you know, as opposed to just some random group of, of people taking it on themselves, although they would have themselves be a militia. That said, I wanted to talk about Bacon's Rebellion because it shows the paradoxes of using a militia to, uh, to run a place. Um, of relying exclusively on the militia. And you'd see this again in Shays' Rebellion and the Whiskey Rebellion, um, that when your citizens are your only armed force, uh, it really does limit the government's control. Um, 
and uh, Nathaniel Bacon and his supporters decided that they wanted to start disobeying the governor. And the governor, uh, I mean, he tried to call out the militia on Bacon, and half of the militia was already following Bacon. That was who was in the rebellion. And the other half weren't willing to fight against their what they viewed as their fellow Virginians. Um, and it, it was a huge mess that, that Berkeley never really got himself out of. He was already quite old by that time. Um, but he couldn't bring the rebellion under control. Um, because again, there's, there's, what's he going to bring it under control with? If your only armed force is the militia and you, you, um, you issue an unpopular decision, uh, you don't have the militia to enforce it because the militias are going to be the ones, uh, rebelling against it. Now, it, there was always something in discussions of the historical militia where, in some cases, it is this horribly disorganized force. In other cases, it is this brutally effective, um, domina- dominating force. And, and it's always a little tricky to understand how these two fit together. Um, but if you look at it on racial lines, things do start to, to make sense. The Stoner Rebellion was very different. Uh, the people, the Stoner Rebellion, so this is 1739. 1676 to 1739 makes a big difference when you're talking about colonial U.S. history. Um, there were enslaved Africans in Virginia in 1676. Anybody who's paid attention to the news knows that 1619 is the start of that. But it was not yet a slave society. Um, South Carolina in 1739 was a slave society, and the Stoner Rebellion was a group of African um, Africans, so men, uh, it's certainly mostly men, if not all men, who had been born in Africa and sold into slavery um, in um, in the New World, uh, but 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 sold as as adults with military training who began a rebellion in South Carolina. Um, and had some initial success and started to, ha- after having um, defeated some of the, the first resistance, started to head south towards Florida, which at that time was Spanish and was offering freedom to, uh, to enslaved people who made it there. And uh, were, they, they were spotted by chance by the head authority of the, uh, of the colony uh, who raised the militia. And, and this is where you do see the militia as a horribly effective, efficient uh, fighting force. Um, there is a, a unity that could be found. There was a unity that could be found among white militiamen when it came to something like uh, an uprising of enslaved people. And within a day... They've tracked down the um, uh, the rebellion, um, killed most of them, um, you know, in putting heads on on road posts, um, uh, really quite quite grisly stuff. Um, and you, you start to see there what it looked like to have uh, a militia in a slave society. Um, it, there's no sort of non-racial militia, and I include a lot of quotations from militia codes. The, the militias around Boston weren't um, weren't using the militia as a way to racially integrate society. They they had specific um, specific regulations about it, but they were basically a, a militia among white people regulating white people or failing to regulate white people, as the case may be. Uh, militias that were towards the contact places between Native American tribes and white settlement uh, had a different dynamic. But then you bring in the, the militias that intertwined with the slave patrols that really were focused on uh, not just maintaining white supremacy, but specifically on policing the enslaved population. Um, and you can't tell the militia story without talking about them. Um, uh, it's it's the, the slave a, patrols. Yeah, as a slave mm-hmm. patrol. Well, slave patrols. Usually, this term in Sally Haddon's book on on slave patrols is is excellent. It, it, it's too good because now people don't write about them anymore. Um, but it's. Um, 
I shouldn't say it quite like that, but it it's fairly definitive. But there were paid slave patrols and there were militiamen. Uh, and the militiamen, by definition, are not uh, not paid professionals. Um, a militia, and people are using this term by this time, the militia duty was required of citizens uh you know, uh, some you could get out of it if you were a governor, or if you were a priest. But you know, this is a required duty of the the white South Carolinians, the white Massachusetts, um, the white Connecticut people, and people white people in Connecticut and white New Yorkers, all that. Um, and and, and white, white white men, to be a little more precise. Yes, white yep. men. Uh, yeah, it's sorry. Ra- ra- well, racialized and gendered from from the beginning. From the beginning, yes. Um, I, I was saying citizens early, and then I dropped that. But yes, the citizen is a status referred uh, reserved to men, um, often included for poor white men. Uh, and this is a transition from the European setting. Um, and uh, this is this is one of the key points. Um, one of the things, and this goes back to um, or I blocking the name of the the Edmund Morgan book um uh white white slavery white freedom um, um it's it's one of the real I'm blocking the name of the book but it's one of the you know sort of top 10 classic books of 20th century US history Edmund Morgan's history of Virginia and um and he's he's explaining why he doesn't put it in these terms but why or he, maybe he does why the class divisions in Europe wind up being replaced in Virginia by racial distinctions. And um, and I actually think that, you know, Alan Taylor, another historian, well, you know, he's still writing today. Uh, one of the things he points out, uh, militias not only were used to keep non-whites down, whether Native American people, free blacks, or especially enslaved African and African Americans, uh, but these militias strengthen the bonds the among white among white people, the white men who uh, who participated and their families up and down the social ladder, uh, up and down the white social ladder, uh, a sort of a trading of um, racial status for for class status. In, invention uh, of, of whiteness and 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 yeah, Ted Allen, David Rudiger, and like yeah, and I mean we talk about haves versus have-nots, but you mm-hmm. know have what? And we always assume it's money, but if you look at different societies and ask who has guns and who doesn't, you can learn a lot about those societies. Yeah, yeah. So what I mean, what what I really appreciated about that sort of hinge point in the book is that you go from this transatlantic, more sort of intellectual history discussion about citizenship and militias and soldier as citizen, citizen as soldier, to the material realities of life in colonial America, settler colonialism, and and not just settler colonialism, but settler colonialism with growing slave societies. That is a society where it's Everything is infected with the institution of of slavery, and that the combination of those two, and this path towards the Second Amendment, I found really, really eye opening. Because again, as the world historian, I appreciated that transatlantic framing, and then with the specificities, specific, <laughs> the specifics. Sorry, it's getting late in the podcast. Um, of of what the conditions are, um, especially the the racialized conditions in in the colonies, um. Now, who was who was Andrew Fletcher, and what, what's what's the Standing Army controversy? So I, I, I'm glad you asked that because uh, I, I this is a part of the story that that I don't think people appreciate. Um, the so I'll try to do this quickly. People look to the 1688 Glorious Revolution and the 1689 uh, England's Bill of Rights as these key moments in the history of, you know, for for weak historians, this is everything. This is when liberty prevails and Parliament is superior over the king. And the the, the Bill of Rights is important. And the Bill of Rights did specifically. Get, this is the first time you really see um, a. Um, uh, a right to bear arms. Let me just see if I can, I have this ready. Um, that the subjects which are Protestants may have arms for the defense suitable to their conditions and as allowed by law. 
Uh, and it also specifies that the raising or keeping a standing army within the kingdom of peace, unless it be with consent of parliament, is against law. Now, this is 1689. Um, but uh, France was at war with England then, uh, and they were until 1697. And so nobody was going to say, all right, you know, King William, you need to get rid of your army. And he's going to say, well, wait, I'm still battling the French. When the treaty comes, um, it, William, uh, this is William of William and Mary, his opposition to France was more of a traditional sort of dynastic rivalry, uh, less focused on uh, England's tradition of liberties. And so par par there are those in Parliament that want to disband the army, and William wants to keep it. And uh, there is a debate uh, in the press, uh, well, I should say in, in pamphlets, about whether or not he should keep the army. And this is key because so much the writing that comes up between it's like 1697 and 1705 pretty much gets all the ideas out there. Uh, Andrew Fletcher... Uh, was my favorite of these authors. And uh, John Trenchard is also writing then. But Andrew Fletcher, he, among others, elaborates this whole theory that uh, building on this idea that we've seen before, that you can only trust citizen soldiers, uh, that you can't trust mercenaries. Um, he wanted to show how the militias will fight better in standing armies because they're fighting for their homes and their countries, whereas mercenaries are just fighting for their money, that standing armies, if you have a standing army, you will inevitably become unfree. And uh, again, that you can't, it doesn't make any sense to defeat France if in the process you just become France. Um, he takes this two steps further, at least in my analysis. One is to say that it's not just that citizens make better soldiers. Uh, but that soldiers make better citizens. Um, that if you are going through the training, and I think I talked about this a little before, if you're going through the training of becoming a soldier, you learn discipline, you learn self-discipline, you learn how to put others first, you learn how to endure hardships, as Roman Republicans had, but as Roman Imperials lost. Um, and then my favorite part of this argument, that if, because nope, this was in, in many ways a profoundly unpopular idea. Um, most people, if asked, do they want to be in the militia? Uh, Michael, they reacted like you do. No, I don't. I don't want to go and train. I don't want to go and spend my time doing this. And you have to get up early. You have to make your bed. <laughs> what, he said, <laughs> what he said was that the problem there was not that there was too much obligation, but that there was not enough. Uh, and that if you really force people to do this, they will come to love it. Um, and you know what, if you talk to, to, to French men our age, uh, they had to do this sort of measly little military service and they hated it. Um, but you know, the Swiss, the, to say nothing of South Koreans, Singaporeans, uh, Israelis, uh, who have a much more rigorous military duty requirement, uh, are much less resentful of it. Um, so, but that that became this thing that th this recurring, you know, it, it, whatever whatever problems the militia might have, they can always be solved if you have more militia. <laughs> so, um, how does the role and the performance of militias in the American Re Revolution contribute to this uh, path towards the Second Amendment? You know, it's it's a it's a it's a common question. I included a section on uh, a chapter on Lexington and Concord and Lexington and Concord was, you know, in everything that militia advocates had been fearful of and also everything they dreamed of uh, a standing army. In this case, Britain's own standing army fighting against their fellow Britons was coming to stamp out the, uh, the flames of Liberty. Uh, but citizen soldiers stood up and fighting for their homes and, and their families. They defeated the, um, that standing army and made the British march back to Boston. Um, after that, after that, the militias didn't do much during the army. And this is, this is an old, old th this debate is, is as old as revolutionary historiography. How, how much did the militias contribute? Uh, and I don't try to 
to chime in there. Um, the militias did enough that you could look back from the from 1781, from 1783, and, and still, if you wanted to be, be hostile to standing armies. Um, now, people like Washington and Hamilton thought that that was insane. Like, you know, what did you see? You weren't out there with us. Um, but uh, one thing you see in, you know, in, in the United States of the 1790s is that th there's still a lot of hostility on the part of non-soldiers uh, towards soldiers, towards former soldiers. Not, you know, there weren't this, you know, it, it was a different mindset uh, towards the, the men who had fought. Certainly the men who had fought as non-officers. So um, describe the debates uh, during the writing of the Constitution. Um, what were the main concerns regarding militias and standing armies? And and then how does uh, Shays Rebellion impact the process of um, formation of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights? So the, the American Revolution ends, you know, 1781, 1783, somewhere in there, depending on, on how you want to put it. And they try to go forth with this very uneasy uh, Articles of Confederation. And, and from the start, there are people who, again, like Hamilton and probably like Washington, who want a more robust central government. Um, the standard argument is that Shays' Rebellion is what puts the final nail in the Article of Confederation's coffin. Um, the Articles of Confederation have been a very loose uh, association that did, you know, call for a militia and that did reject any sort of standing army. I forget the exact phrasing. Um, when, so Shays' Rebellion plays out a lot like uh, Bacon's Rebellion. This is the, the militia start, you know, it's a white uprising and these are all men who have a role in the militia and they they start their, their rebellion and... Um, the governor, it's not Hancock then, it's, it's another governor, calls out the militia and half of them are already in the rebellion and the other half don't want to fight their fellow Massachusetts militiamen and it, it goes out of control. Uh, Washington is fundamentally embarrassed about this and, and this pushes enough of the momentum towards redoing the Constitution. And that part's a, that, that's a story that's been told a lot. Um. When you get to the the militia clause, now the militia clause, people, I don't know how picky to be about this. The militia clause is a clause in the Constitution. It's, it's if you're being technical, it's not the first half of the Second Amendment. The militia clause is in the Constitution, and it gives the um, it gives Congress the power to call forth the militia to suppress and repel invasions and to provide organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia. It doesn't do that much. It doesn't really do anything to prevent another Shays Rebellion from happening. Uh, what it does to, to – so the Massachusetts governor couldn't really do anything. He couldn't ask Rhode Island for help. He couldn't ask Connecticut for help. Like that just wasn't in the Articles of Confederation. Um, the Constitution, which it does many things, which you can learn about in many places um, – it gives Congress, and this would later be shifted to the president, it gives Congress the authority to call the militia from other states and to have some role in ensuring that every state's militia was up to snuff. Um, and so there's different – there's the writing of the, of the Constitution – the debates over the ratification, the addition of the Bill of Rights, and then the the addition of the and the ratification of the Bill of Rights, uh, and the militia is is central in all of these. Um, the uh, if you the most famous of these debates comes in Virginia, and th these debates are all online, and you see you know George Mason and Patrick Henry debating against um, James Madison and others for an, uh, against and for ratification, and uh, the militia was one of the big concerns. Um, what does it mean to give the national government control over this? what had been state – they had been colonial militias, and then as the colonies became states, they became state militias. Um, and everybody is 
debating this in terms of, is this going to be a permanent army? Now, Hamilton, Washington, they would like to have a small permanent army, um, but they lose that debate badly in 1783, 85. Um, And so what you have is... um, Patrick Henry and others arguing that the national control of the militia was in in effect the creation of a standing army, and um, Hamilton in the in the Federalist um, the Federalist Papers uh, arguing that the only prevent the best prevention of a standing army is to have uh, a, fa- a competent militia, um, and so these debates about militia were were central to this. Um, this isn't the main point of my book, but we're, nobody's talking about a right to bear arms there. It just doesn't come up. Uh, people were obsessed with, well, I shouldn't say obsessed. People were concerned about the militia. If you look at Jefferson's letter to Madison, he's saying there should be a bill of rights. It should deal with standing armies. Uh, people were still concerned about this idea that there would be full-time professional soldiers. Um, and that these professional soldiers would be loyal to um, loyal to their generals and not to uh, the United States as a whole. The dream died yeah. hard. P- pardon? The dream died hard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so to recap, um, how does the Second Amendment not make sense for the society that America has become? Well, the Second Amendment declares – that a well-regulated militia is necessary for the security of a free state. Uh, just to recap, um, or to, to further explain, uh, the people of the 18th century understood that you needed to be secure from outside invasion. Um, and so you needed some sort of armed force. Uh, but they believed that if that armed force was a professional army, that you could not be a free society. Your freedom always existed only at the whim of whoever was leading that army. Uh, therefore, you know you could be free by having no armed forces then, but then you weren't secure. Uh, the way that they sought to be secure and free was to have an army uh, that was made up of citizen soldiers, which is to say militiamen. Uh, and that well-regulated militia allowed the citizens to be both secure and free. Um, And that's my interpretation of the first half of the Second Amendment. Uh, Other people will have other ones, but if you can't make sense of the idea that a well-regulated militia is necessary for the security of a free state, then it doesn't make sense. It's 27 words. If, If half of them don't make sense to you, then you know, then it doesn't make sense. Uh, now, I think there's a lot of other things going wrong with the United States, uh, and I think gun violence is is a major issue. Uh, that's putting it way too softly. Gun violence is an ongoing tragedy that none of us should have to worry about. Um, it's certainly not to the extent that we do. Uh, and, and there's no point in pretending to not see uh, the tragedy that's ongoing and the obvious causes of it. Um, but the historical argument that I'm making is that we've moved away from that world. Uh, we, we aren't an 18th century society anymore. Um, and uh, for us to have a society that in all senses makes sense to us, in all ways makes sense to us, we're going to have to... We're going to have to move past, well, among other things, we're going to have to move past this idea that uh, all of us, uh, Michael, you included, should be spending uh, several weekends a summer uh, at our musters learning how to march and shoot and uh, all those other crazy fun things. Not if I have to get up early and make my own bed. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, so so to, to, put the, to get this into my little world historian's brain, I mean, is it is one of the issues that we've we've forgive me, but cross the Rubicon and we, we now have a professional army. We have had one for some time. Um, I mean, how, how could, how could a militia handle the technological sophistication of contemporary warfare? I mean, it, it just seems, I mean, you, you say it no longer makes sense. I mean, it just, to me, it just seems so anachronistic. I mean, militias, I mean, 
what, what, what would a militia do today? I mean, I, I, I guess you could throw um, the Vietnamese National Liberation Front at me or um, other other forms of guerrilla warfare. But um, it, again, it just seems like such an anachronism. If the if the significance of the Second Amendment is the militia and not the arms bearing. Well, it it is an anachronism in the U.S. Uh, I don't know what you would say about Switzerland, about South Korea, about Israel, uh, where there is, you know, everybody, there, there are many professional soldiers, but everybody has done a significant amount of time there. Um, and when the, the generals call out the army, they're calling out a large number of people who have other views, other plans. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Um, I know that you're not going to get anywhere running on either ticket if you, if this is your platform. Um, and so, yeah, originalism, um, originalism is bullshit and there's no reason to phrase it otherwise. Um, and, and I, I think that in some ways I, uh, you know, looking at this book, I, I was too polite uh, because I wanted to be able to talk about the 18th century and or- originalism provided that opportunity. Um, but there's nothing about what the courts are deciding today that has anything to do with the 18th century. Um, I they're do not, think, as I said, about that, militias either. No, they're not talking about militias. Uh, and I don't think that talking about the 18th century would be the best way to go about things. Um, and so, uh, yes, it's anachronistic, uh, and it's, it's a mess. Um, and I don't think we, I'm an historian. Uh, I want to study history to know what happened. And maybe that's a little indulgent of me. I wanted to study history to, uh, to be able to put our lives into a broader, uh, and deeper context and to enrich our understanding of it. Um, at some level, uh, given the nature of this debate, I want to study history to be able to counter the historical arguments of those with whom I disagree. Um, Sisyph- Sisyphian um, labor, though that may be. Um, but I also, you know, I, I want to be able to, you know, if we move back to the United States, I want to be able to send my kid to school and not worry about the things that every American parent has to worry about. Um, so these are, this is where we, we stand. Um, there are, uh, there are a lot of absurdities that we, uh, have to, uh, spend our, our valuable time disproving these days. Well, I mean, this leads me to the next thing I want to ask you. Um, uh, you know, scholarly work on such hot button issues as the Second Amendment can lead to a range of public reactions. Um, have you faced any criticism for armed citizens? And and let me note that we're speaking on uh, August twenty second, my time, uh, August twenty third, your time. This is uh, less than a week after the now infamous um, AHA president's column on presentism and the and the influx of right wing trolls on uh, Twitter that forced the AHA to shut down its uh, social media um, platform. So, I mean, have have you faced any criticism? I mean, is there has there been some response to this i mean be care- I, I know this comes under be careful what you wish for but no i've gotten very little criticism um uh, yeah i would have liked to have the book to have had a little bit more impact uh than it's had um this is not some new and unique complaint that no other author has ever come across um you know i i I wrote I I wrote the and I can blame myself. I wrote the book slowly, um, and I, we delayed publication for a couple of months because it it was going to come out when nobody was going to talk about anything other than COVID. And then uh, we tried to hit that window between uh, COVID, 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 and election, election, election. But uh, you know everybody else did too. So I have not gotten much pushback. Um, like I said, I would have liked to have had more impact, but but sometimes that's ugly. So it's yeah. I mean, um, based on what we saw this week, I mean, with that 
you know, <laughs> very debatable, very controversial column. Um, but the way in which the uh, the public got involved, shall we say, um, boy. <laughs> I, I never read perspectives, not not out of some moral decision. I just very rarely do, and, and so I, I haven't read that piece either. Um, I, uh, I I do tend to be. I, I try to be somebody who accepts apologies, um, but I, I stayed out of the the ugliness of that. It's a it's a piece on presentism, and. Um, it, I mean, it, it's so it's so linked to what you're. I mean, it, but both in terms of it's that it's a piece on presentism, but also that it provoked um, this reaction from uh, the public. I mean, it's a certain section of the public. Again, it was the right wing trolls, which you know, I, uh, a book on the Second Amendment could also run that danger. Both you know, being critiqued as presentist and then um, bringing in um, uh, bad faith actors. Right. You hear these voices in your head, not not like in the Joan of Arc way, but like when you're when you're rehearsing the arguments that you're making, and you're you're trying to say, you know, you, you need to do that. You need to think, well, who is this argument for? Who is this argument going to convince? It? And you know, you find yourself like trying to, you know, when are the potential right wing counter arguments? Or left wing counter arguments, um, but for me, more often right wing counter arguments. When are they worth engaging with? When are they not worth engaging with? Which fights are am I, am I willing to pick? Which fights am I not willing to pick? Um, and, and it's tricky because you don't know when this is, you know, part of what should be every scholar's legitimate process of self critique and self examination, and part of you know, and what's just you know, sort of fear or or insecurities and and what's you know genuine concern for one's well-being it's it it's a messy world messier than it has to be yeah i've got, I've got colleagues that work on um uh, uh reproductive history and um women's health and have to wrestle with uh with these these debates and these these questions and so forth so you've been really generous with your time um I've got two more questions before I let you go. These are the the standards, uh, standard uh, new books network questions. Um, first, can you suggest two books for the listeners to read? Uh, I'm a primary sources guy, uh, so I, I really I would love it if more people would read the um, Andrew Fletcher's book, uh, Discourse on Government with Relation to Malicious. Uh, there's a Cambridge one of those blue books that includes it, but you can find it online. Uh, I think it's quirky and fun. Uh, maybe that's why I became a historian. Not everybody will think it's quirky and fun, but I, I like the energy in it. Um, the book I'm going to read next, which I haven't, so I can't recommend it, but Carol Anderson has a book just called The Second, which I, I hear really good things about, and her interviews have been great. Um, and I, I wish I could recommend it, but I can't because I haven't read it. Um, uh so meanwhile, I will still say I, I still think overall uh, Saul Cornell's 2006 book, uh, Well-Regulated Militias, is, is, remains the best book I've read, uh, well, is again the best book I've read on the topic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then finally, um, what are you working on now and what can we hope to see from you next? Uh, I've got a journal uh, article coming out in um, the Journal of Military History, cultural historian me, uh, on the somewhat organized violence of revolutionary Paris in the first three years of the French Revolution. So very excited about that, a way to sort of say some of the things I've wanted to say. Uh, but what I'm working on, I'm trying to do a uh, a history of Atlantic revolutionaries. Um, I haven't looked at this in a, a few months, but a history of uh, people, mostly men, not entirely, uh, but who participated in more than one of the American, French, and Haitian revolutions, and uh, try to look at at you know how their own. I, I'm very interested, concerned with this question of what it means to represent Enlightenment ideals from a historical context in in the world at large. Um, I, I say this as you know, as this American Jewish guy living and teaching in Hong Kong in a very specific um, Asian but post-colonial context where these um, 
these enlightenment ideals from the 18th century mean mean the world to a lot of the people living here and um i was trying to figure out what this meant to you know for my own position and and my way of of addressing these is to try to find specific historical figures that that i can track this to so i'll be talking about uh thomas paine and um Jean Paul Marat and Mary Wollstonecraft and and how they tried to be part of some form of international revolution and how that didn't didn't work out for them. Excellent. Well, we, we look forward to that. Um, Dr. Schusterman, no Schusterman, thank you so much for um, talking with me today. Uh, it's been my pleasure, Mike. Thanks so much. So this has been a conversation with Noah Schusterman about Armed Citizens, The Road from Ancient Rome to the Second Amendment, published by the University of Virginia Press in 2020. I'm Michael Van of Sacramento State University, and this has been an episode of New Books in History, a channel on the New Books Network. Thank you for listening.